Isn't it good? Wait, wait. So to repeat for You'll the audience, especially the audience in streaming, uh, this uh, what Travis is being judged on is like licorice and yeah, like licorice tree had sex with alcohol. Yeah. Well. Um. Cool. Are we about ready? Streaming going? All right, so All right, with cool. that, uh, we'll please give Travis Goodspreed a warm Shmukon welcome. Cool. Howdy, y'all. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about arm emulation tricks. Um, uh, a, a while back, um, I was working with Abelian Francian and Jonas Zadek and uh, Anil Kramus and like some other some other very very smart people, and we got together and we wrote a weaponized backdoor that runs as a firmware patch for a, a hard disk whose brand name should not be mentioned but is totally Seagate. And <laughs> um, academic publishing is weird, so like um, we got really strange review comments back. Um, one of the things that we did was uh, we wrote it in two parts. We had the back door running as a fake block device for uh, QAMU, so that we could boot a Linux operating system around it and then like try it out from the attack standpoint, separate from our patches to the actual device firmware. And then on the device side, we spent most of our time getting uh, GDB stub working so that we could do temporary development. And then we just merged these two in the middle. Um, the, the trouble with writing an emulator, though, like a full from scratch system emulator that could emulate, say, the whole hard disk, is that it is a shit ton of work. Um, video game emulators spend uh, a ton of effort making sure that they're accurate in every degree. Um, uh, mostly because their audience is made up of uh, video game enthusiasts who are better known as assholes. And so they, they spend all of this time like, getting this uh, authenticity right. And um, I don't have that much time when I'm attacking a new target or I need to extract something from firmware. So this lecture shows you how to quickly take a firmware dump and rewrite it into a Linux executable so that you can use it from the command line with just the, the pieces of it that you've salvaged. So in my case, I've extracted an audio codec, which is proprietary from a handheld radio firmware. And then I can take that audio codec and I can use it to encode and uh, decode the, um, the packets that are on the air so that from a packet capture, I can get a wave recording or from a uh, wave recording, I can produce packets to be transmitted. Uh, this might be useful if you wanted to patch the radio firmware in order to make all outbound audio Rick Astley. Um, but out of consideration for you, my beloved audience, I will not be playing any uh, Rick Astley this evening. OK, audio is working on the laptop. So um, the folks who worked with me on this individual project, uh, Paula, DD4CR, um, she took the clear text dump of the firmware, um, which I'm going to show you how to produce in the next section, and she took the encrypted firmware update from the manufacturer, and she figured out exactly uh, where and how much their crypto sucked. And thanks to her, we now have a tool that can encrypt and decrypt the firmware updates so that you don't have to tear your own radio apart in order to reproduce this work. Uh, David, AB3TL, uh, he helped me out with uh, the way that the codec works in that he knows what goes where. And uh, Alex, DF8AV, is no longer with us, but um, he fixed my demo when it was broken in the Git repo. Uh, uh, he is also responsible for reverse engineering the menu structure of the radio and a bunch of other work in this project. Uh, but I'm going to begin about, uh, by talking about another fellow, and his name is Ralph. Um, Ralph is someone that you should never take legal advice from, uh, and Ralph really loves police auctions because he's one of those hams who likes pretending that he's a policeman um, by like buying equipment and running around and uh, really ticking off the real police. So Ralph hung out at a Wendy's 
And um, the Wendy's called the uh, sheriff's deputies on them. And the sheriff's deputies were called because Ralph had bought a radar gun, which you can just totally do. And he was sitting there in his car in the Wendy's parking lot, and he was zapping cars that were going down uh, Alcoa Highway in Knoxville, Tennessee. So the, the sheriff's deputy comes over, and he gets out of his car, and he knocks on the window, and he's like, Ralph, are you really dragging me back here for a third time today? And Ralph said, no, the, the government and the Constitution. He's like, Ralph, this isn't a constitutional issue. I'm just telling you to go the fuck home. And he's like, but I got a ham radio license. He's like, Ralph, you're pretty sure that your radio license does not let you like, annoy random tourists. That's our job. Leave it to the professionals. <laughs> like, Ralph, you got to go home. And he says, but I don't want to go home. They said, okay, Ralph, you don't have to go home, but you can't do this in Knox County. And so he's like, so I can't do this in Knox County. So Ralph goes to Klingman's Dome, which is the highest location in uh, the Southern Appalachians. And he sits there with his radar gun and he just sort of like sprays it across uh, all of Interstate 40 and 75. And all of those like red lights from the brakes start slamming on as people uh, with their radar detectors start. <laughs> <laughs> so today we'll be talking about the Titera MD380. Uh, it's a handheld radio that you can buy for about 100 bucks. Amazon will deliver it tomorrow. Uh, last year at the Fire Talks, I showed how to um, dump the firmware and make the, the smallest of patches to it. Since then, we now have like, a full open source project built around this. The radio firmware itself, the manufacturer, is still proprietary. Um, rather than rewrite it from scratch, we've reverse engineered it well enough to know how to hook into it. So we can add our own menu system. Um, we can read and write from the spy flash, we can read and write from the radio. Uh, we added our own USB stack so that we're able to sniff packets or inject them. Um, we can capture text messages, we can see how hilariously awful the on-the-air encryption is. Um, the radio itself is a 5-watt UHF transmitter. They also have a VHF version. It does analog FM or DMR, or digital mobile radio, which is very popular among um, hotel events, uh, security, uh, campus police departments. The, the larger police departments don't use this protocol. They use another one called P25. Um, if you go to crypto.com slash P25, you can see all the, uh, the fun mistakes in that. The CPU is an STM32 F405, which is an ARM microcontroller with a megabyte of flash and 192K of general purpose RAM. Um, the, uh, the chip runs an instruction set called Thumb2, which is self-contained. So if your chip can run Thumb2, it does not need the wider 32-bit ARM instructions. Um, your Raspberry Pi can run this instruction set in addition to the faster instruction set that a lot of its code is written in. Um, now, this is way too small to boot Linux. It has no memory management unit. It has none of that. Um, but like in theory, Linux could run its code. Um, it also has a Chinese-designed uh, C5000 uh, radio ASIC from uh, a company that I think is pronounced Haorong, but I have no bloody clue. Um, although I am told that China's number one. Um, it has 16 megabytes of spy flash, and it was originally designed for one meg. So having 16, we have 15 left over that the original firmware doesn't use. Um, we've got a, a phone book that sits in there of every registered amateur user of the protocol, so that when an incoming call comes in, uh, it shows you the name and the call sign and the city and the state and the country. Uh, this triggered a privacy scare in the Netherlands and they now like uh, scrub the database. Um, the networking protocol can also be routed between cities. So this is Volnet, which is the, the Tennessean one. Uh, this image is a bit old, it now extends as far as Memphis. So across the entire state of Tennessee, you can call like pretty much anywhere else in Tennessee and have full voice. Um, Text messaging is not routed, but the voice is, and uh, you can have your conversation. You can also call in to specific talk groups. So during the Chaos Communications Congress uh, in December, you could call into the Congress from uh, like Reno or, um, or here in DC. 
USB runs over like a little cable in it. And um, with our tools, you can do packet capture. You can also reflash them, uh, reflash the radio itself from your Android phone. Because uh, while Android is an awful operating system, it has excellent USB host support. Um, so in order to get the firmware out, um, you need like a bug. And um, I figured that since you folks were here for the Windows talk, you might enjoy like uh, a bug that's exploited very differently on the device than it would be in Windows. So uh, in Windows or in Linux, when you've got like a null pointer dereference read, that's kind of useless because um, there's nothing at address zero. And even if you can add something there, it's something that you control. So reading it doesn't really help you. Uh, and unindexed means that you can only read at address zero. You can't actually read what's after it. Um, so in Windows or in Unix, you've got like um, a buffer that's null. Like you, you call malloc and you don't check the result. So the pointer is null and then you read from it. Um, accessing the zero page triggers a fault. And uh, you've got to use like an offset or page remapping or like fancy tricks in order to actually exploit that. But in the Cortex-M4, things are a lot easier because flash memory for convenience is mirrored at address zero. Um, so if you can read from address zero, you can read the code of the radio out. Um, and it turns out that um, the DFU protocol that's used, uh, if you don't actually specify which memory you want to read from, then that buffer hasn't been allocated, so it reads from address zero, which gives you a copy of the beginning of flash memory. You can read the first 48 kilobytes, which conveniently enough is the length of the bootloader. And then the bootloader contains the keys to decrypt the rest of the firmware update. So you can patch it in order to leave JTAG unlocked, hook a debugger, and then read the code out. Um, passing a copy of the extracted firmware and the um, encrypted firmware to my buddy Paula, she XORed them together and found that the key was just a repeated stream of 512 bytes. Um, it's a common theme in this device that they use counter mode and that they reset the counter to zero every frame or every block, which you should never do because that's the same as XOR. Um, this is my cat. Her name is Mimim. If Julian Venegg says that it's his cat, he is a liar. Um, now, when you're inside of this firmware, you have things in different positions. Um, if you've dealt with uh, ASLR in debugging, uh, GDB actually like turns ASLR off on your executable in order to make things predictable for you. So sometimes you'll have these bugs that like only trigger when you have the debugger attached, or worse, never trigger when you have the debugger attached. And that's because the memory layout is different. Um, inside of the microcontroller, everything is at a fixed location because um, the code runs out of flash ROM which cannot be conveniently rearranged. So within a given version, a function will always be at the same address. A global variable will always be at the same address. Uh, they don't use a heap, so like nothing is randomized in position. Uh, if you just search a RAM dump and find the address of something, it will consistently be there for that firmware version. Um, now, when you have a pointer inside of this, you can figure out what the pointer means by the first byte of it. If the first byte is 40, it's I.O. This is how the chip interacts with the outside world. This is how it controls its timing. Uh, if it's 20, then it's a general purpose SRAM, which is, not, uh, which is executable, um, but is a little bit slower than tightly coupled RAM, which is if the first byte is uh, 10 hex. Um, so you can actually do like a non-executable stack in this architecture just by putting it in the faster RAM. Um, then if the first byte is an 8, it's flash memory. Um, we have two regions here because the, uh, the bootloader is at the lower address than the application. Uh, but these are physically the same bank. So uh, when you're trying to reverse engineer this, you load it into Ida Pro and you give it the file and you just say that the RAM goes here, the flash goes there, and then it's all loaded up. Uh, you have to do this manually, specifying the address, because there's no... Um, PE file headers or L file headers that tell IDA where things should go. In Redaria 2, which is a computing reverse engineering framework that's free, uh, you can do it from the command line by specifying the architecture, the bit width, and the loading address. Um, now, when you want to do function hooking, um, 
there are two types of function calls inside of the firmware. There are runtime function pointers, which are used by things like the USB stack. These are in RAM, and they're just an address. So all you have to do is have an early piece of your code rewrite that address to point to your handler. This is how we hook the uh, USB stack, so that we can redirect it to our USB handlers, which might go back to the original if it's a command that's not one of ours. Uh, this is how we maintain backward compatibility with the original USB protocol while also adding our own commands. Um, the, you also have uh, BL instructions, or branch and link. Um, these are two instructions in a row which uh, work together and look like one instruction in assembly that actually call a function by a relative address. Uh, but all of the math for doing this is described in the ARM instruction set. So you can write a quick little C function that redirects all calls to a particular address to another address. And this is how we redirect the direct function calls that are not done by a function pointer. And this is my cat, not Julian's cat. So now that like, we're able to change the firmware and we're able to read the firmware and we have a copy of the firmware, um, we also need to be able to like, migrate between different versions of the firmware. So um, on AMD64, function calls look like this. And the, this is a, a screenshot from um, uh, Binary Ninja, I believe. The, uh, the bytes at the left are like that ragged column because they're each, uh, each instruction is of a different length. Uh, on arm and thumb, instructions look much more regular. You've got um, like a length of instructions that are mostly the same width. Uh, and then you've got uh, this, these constants at the very bottom that are called the constant pool. Um, this is how arm and thumb do immediate values. So the immediate values are not actually part of the function. And the branch and link instructions that I mentioned earlier, um, they all begin with an F in the highest nibble. So you can actually like, compare the two for equality just by saying that two functions are as similar as pairs of bytes are equal or the pairs of half word, uh, the half word pairs like, begin with an F. Uh, and so you come up with this like, lovely little algorithm that can just run through and tell you that one function matches another. So when you're trying to run the, load this thing like, live, you can actually search for a function rather than hard code the address in order to automatically migrate between different versions of the firmware. Uh, we have to do this because the manufacturer forked the code base and it actually works differently between um, the GPS models and the non-GPS models, as Mimin well knows. Uh, so what we really want, though, is we want this like, emulator tool that will run on the Unix command line that can run the audio codec library functions for us so that we can conveniently convert a WAV file to packets or packets back to a WAV file. Um, instead of writing a complete ARM emulator, what we're going to do is we're going to statically link the old firmware into a, uh, a new executable for ARM Linux and then use QMU user or QMU binfmt to run that on AMD64 Linux. You can do this with uh, MMAP um, because you know, we're in a 32-bit ARM process. Uh, and the difference between ARM and thumb is whether the function pointer that you're calling is even or odd. So uh, as long as you're calling like the byte after where the function begins, it automatically converts it for you. Um, so we just load the firmware to the address where the firmware should go, and then we load the, um, uh, we load the RAM where the RAM should go. The other option is to do this live, or not live, but at, at linking time, by uh, rewriting the binary dumps into proper ELF files and then linking them together. And you can do this with OBJ copy, and then um, also tell GCC that you want these particular sections at these addresses. Uh, you can give it whatever flag you like, so the executable code remains executable, the RAM remains writable. You can also change things up a bit. You can make the flash memory easily rewritable like RAM so that you can patch it live without having to do it against the file. And at the very end, you get... Hello, this is Linux Stewart, and I pronounce Unix as Linux. This audio file was converted from WAV to the AMBI compressed format and then back. And this allows you to 
decode audio off of the air without ever having to write an emulator from the Unix command line. Uh, thank you kindly. And this is my cat, not Julian's cat. Um, yes, the, the cat's name is Mimin. Uh, she's a very nice cat. Um, but um, I, I think she'd be better living in my home than his. So if you speak to him, if you know Julian Vanag, just remind him that he needs to give me my cat back and that I'm not joking. <laughs>